results according to and uh, evaluate the response of the drugs also. Next slide. So the current scenario in the past it was anatomy basically when you had when you talked about medical imaging that is plain films, organ and tissue imaging, scintigraphy, CT, MR and ultrasound. Now the present is functional that is nuclear medicine, PEC, PEC, MR spectroscopy and the angiography and others and the hybrid is PEC, CT, PEC, CT and PEC, MR. And the future again is uh, PEC, PEC, NM, MR is optical imaging and contrast in mass MRI ultrasound and CT. Okay. Now we will I'll come to the basic technologies and the, for the medical devices that are used for molecular imaging. It's gamma camera and uh, what a single photon emission computer tomography which is again a gamma camera which can rotate. Um, so what exactly is a gamma camera? Gamma camera has been with us since almost half a decade. The first gamma camera was built by Hal Anker in 1950s and we still have a gamma camera can never go obsolete because it still holds its value and there are many uh, procedures which can be fully done on a gamma camera as of today. A uh, gamma camera is a specialized camera that is capable of detecting a radio tracer. The, uh, the camera creates 2D pictures of the, of, of the inside of the body from different angles. And what is spec? It uses a gamma camera that rotates around the patient to detect a radio tracer in the body. Working with a computer, spec creates 3D images of the areas being studied. Spec may also be combined with CT for greater accuracy. And then the latest, that is positron emission tomography, which has actually brought about a paradigm shift in oncology. It has actually made life so simple for oncologists that they now know that it is being used for treat, uh, treat, stage, and manage most cancers. And uh, if you, when I was actually uh, doing my uh, course in uh, BARC, there were we were going to set up the first cyclotron. This was somewhere in 1999-2000 when we were supposed to set up the first cyclotron in RMC. And now if you ask me today, there are more than 50-60 PET CT centers in the world with at least 10-12 cyclotrons. Most government institutes have their own cyclotrons where they do their research. And um, it's, it's, it's for, for all the tremendous change in the way medical imaging has uh, changed in this country. And, um, and believe me, these scans are not very uh, cheap, they are quite expensive, but people get it done to know that yes, it's finally in cancer, it's all about prognosis. So once you know whether a particular chemotherapy or a drug is working for you, it, it really improves the patient's quality of life, his confidence that he is going to live longer and it also becomes very satisfying for the treating physician. So what is what is PET CT? It's a combination of PET and computer tomography that produce highly detailed views of the body. The combination of two imaging techniques called fusion imaging or hybrid imaging allows information from two different types of scan, that is molecular imaging from PET and anatomical imaging from CT to, to be viewed into a single set of images. CT images using advanced X-ray equipment are in some cases a contrast uh, enhancing material to produce 3D images. A combined PET CT study is able to provide detail on both their anatomy and function of organs and tissues. This is accomplished by superimposing the precise location of abnormal metabolic activity from PET against a detailed anatomic image from CT. Next slide. So I will first start with the camera, camera which uh, this is what uh, nuclear medicine and molecular imaging started from. Uh, like uh, X-rays will still be the base for radiology. For us, it is always gamma camera. The first simulation uh, gamma camera was developed by Hal Anker in 1958, and the first commercial uh, and the first commercial gamma camera was installed in Ohio in 1962. Today, the principles of Anker camera are used in modern day gamma cameras. That's Hal Anker doing his first scan on his first uh, gamma camera. what exactly are the components of a gamma camera. So you have a patient here who is injected with a radioisotope. In most, uh, uh, most cases a gamma emitting radioisotope which is with a short half life and uh, energy anywhere between 140 to 200 kV so that uh, you know the, the radiation burden to the patient is less. So you, these emitted gamma rays are picked up by the gamma camera and then you have the image form. 
So the first component is a collimator. Then you have a scintillation detector crystal which is sodium iodide doped with thallium. A light tide assembly, the photomultipliers, preamp and amps, then the pulse height analyzer and finally the image uh, formation. So, what does a collimator do? It actually collimates the gamma rays. A collimator is just like a camera lens uh, where the light is, it focuses the light. So, what it does is the gamma rays, uh, the principle of any radioactive substance is it will emit rays in all directions. So, you need to collimate these rays. So, the gamma rays needs to be focused onto the scintillation detector. So, what it, it does this by a principle of absorptive collimation. And the absorptive collimator, it projects an image of the source distribution onto the detector by allowing only those gamma rays traveling along a certain direction to reach the detector. Uh, when a person or a patient is injected with a radioisotope, um, it is not necessary that the rays emitted from the patient would come out in a linear path. There will be scatter. What we mean by scatter is when it comes out of a tissue, it can, the path can be deviated. So we don't, the scatter rays will always add to the noise in image. Any image or any image reconstruction technique is always to cut out the noise and give a good clean picture of the object being imaged. So here what the collimator does is it will pick up only rays which are coming out directly from the patient and it will pass it on to the detector. The collimators are made of lead. Uh, lead because lead is a good uh, attenuating material for gamma rays. And this will also avoid uh, crosstalk between uh, from the, uh, and the holes are holes, there are holes in a collimator which is called as septa. Next slide. So on your right hand side there's a small uh, diagram of a collimator. You can see that these are the hexagonal or the hexagonal holes which are uh, through which the gamma rays will pass and and then be detected by the detector. You have different types of uh, collimators, the parallel mode, diverging, converging and fit. The most common use, commonly used uh, collimator is the parallel mode collimator. Okay, now we come to the detector characteristics. Now that we have uh, a patient who is emitting a, a radio gamma isotope, it has to be detected. So what will, what type of a material will detect the gamma rays? It is a detector or a crystal of sodium iodide doped with thallium. Why sodium iodide? Because it is a high detection efficiency of the gamma photon. The energy range is there. It can detect an energy range of gamma photons from 40 to 620 keV. It has a high stopping power. What do you mean by a high stopping power? You don't want the gamma rays to pass through and through the detector and not be detected by the uh, electronics. You want it to be stopped and the signal to be retained and then processed by the electronics. So it has a very good stopping power that is because of its higher uh, density. Then the energy resolution of 9 to 10 percent and, and it yields one light photon per 30 keV. So you also want it to give a good amount of light photons. And then it's transparent to its own scintillation and it can be grown in a large place. There's only one company in the world which grows crystals for all the companies which manufacture gamma cameras. Be it Siemens, Philips or G. Next slide please. Then comes the photomultiplier tube. Um, do I need to talk about the photomultiplier tube? I'm sure all of you must have done it in your class. So could somebody please get up and tell me her speech. In short about the photomultiplier.
So a small weak signal becomes really powerful by the time it comes out of the photomotive light. Next slide please. So this is how it looks like in a gamma camera which has been opened up. These are the photomotive light tubes. And to your right you have an image where the, this is the photomotive light tube, this is the crystal. And it's coupled to the crystal with optical uh, freezing. So there's no loss of light. Next slide. The preamp, uh, this is again, it amplifies the signal produced by the detector which is very small. It matches the impedance level between the detector and subsequent component circuits. It gives a shape to the signal pulse and it provides a driving force so that the pulse will not be lost in the several feet of, uh, feet of cable and it's placed as close to the detector as possible to maximize the performance. That is maxim maximize signal to noise. And the amplifier, it actually still, uh, the, the, the pulse is relatively still small. So it changes the, from a mini volts to the volts and it uh, reshapes the slowly decaying pulse and the, uh, the pulse, is pulse shaping, specifically pulse shortening is an essential function which increases signal to noise, to noise ratio and provides an output of cleanly separated pulse. Next slide. PHA is again a pulse height analyzer. It is an electronic device which differentiates the primary radiation from the secondary radiation that is scatter. In radiation, we have always had to deal with a lot of scatter. So we don't want the scatter to uh, degrade our image quality. So the pulse height analyzer is a uh, device which helps us to only retain pulses or so radiation from a particular, in a particular, uh, of particular energy and cut out the scatter. Next slide. Yeah, the scatter from either photon or from the patient or the crystal in an image formation for in image formation degrade resolution and contrast. Scatter from primary radiation is discriminated by the Z pulse energy. The, the PHA is used to set a window around the photo peak. Photo peak is the main gamma emmer in, uh, energy that the particular radio isotope emits. Um, having lower and upper levels so that the energy falls within this range and and only go for power, that fall within this range, go for further processing. So in case of technetium, which is commonly used in uh, gamma camera studies, the peak is 140. So we have a 10% window. So from 130 to 150, whatever when, uh, energy falls in that range, it is picked up for image formation. Next slide. And then again, the uh, digital circuits, X, Y, Z signals are connected and correction circuits to uh, actually decide on the digital domain and where the signal is coming and which is in uh, image formation. Next slide. So this is how after all this electronics, after the injection and everything, a bone scan looks like. You know, you have injected a radioisotope or a tracer which is specifically picked up by the bones. And here you can see that this, uh, there is a problem in the arm which, which shows an increased uptake. This is the entire skeletal body which we can visualize. Next slide. So this is a spec CT machine. So what you have in a spec CT machine is you have a gamma camera and plus you have a CT gantry attached to it. Next slide please. What is spec? It is single photon emission computer tomography. Only one gamma photon is detected per DK. So you have a have the detectors which rotate around the patient, collect images at the particular points and these images are then deconstructed on the computer to give an idea of the activity distribution in the patient. Next slide. So what value does SPECT have? You already have a gamma camera. So what, what more is it going to add? So it, it improves the image contrast. It gives you 3D images. Uh, a series of images are acquired as the detectors rotate around the patient. Typically, 60 to 120 images will be acquired in 20 to 30 minutes. And these images are reconstructed using filtered back projection to generate transaction slices. Coronal and sagittal slices can also be computed. Are you familiar with the transaction coronal and sagittal slices? Do you have an idea? <coughs> Next slide. So we construct it to actually see how the activity is distributed in the particular organ. When you do, when you just do back projection, it will give you a distribution, but there will be a star artifact which will actually degrade your image. So that's why you do a filtered back projection where you, you apply a filter to cut out the noise 
and get a better image of the activity distribution. Next slide. So this is how it is done. You have the camera rotating at various angles over the patient and then the image is reconstructed. This is an image of the brain. Next slide. PET-CT is hybrid imaging, the fine anatomy, CT and function in the NF and the CT is here is used for localization and attenuation correction. So this is how a small spec CT image looks like. So you have an India, the perp this patient had an injury while uh, playing football. So this is the area of increased uptake which is picked up uh, by the nuclear medicine uh, study, a bone scan. And this is again, this is fused to the, on the CT. So it adds a lot of diagnosis and a lot of value to the treating physician. Next slide. Yeah, this is a patient who's got a compression collapse of the vertebra and uh, this is very nicely delineated in a small spec CT study. This is actually uh, the latest machine has been installed in the Christian Medical College with the, these are images, the, these are the images from that place. And you can see that the 3D images, 3D as well as 2D images are uh, So what do we detect in PET? We detect two photons of pi 11 KV in coincidence coming in a straight line from the same annihilation. So here in PET, you have to, there is a uh, unstable nucleus which emits a uh, positron. These positrons annihilate with a positron annihilates with an electron and there are two gamma rays which come out of, at the same time and each of these photons is of pi 11 KV. This is then detected by the detector and, and within these there is a tiny window which is involved. If you give the time to the detectors and the system is set in such a way that only photons and uh, which are within a particular timing window will be accepted and this is called as true coincidence. Next slide. So you have a CT image here, a PET image and the fuse image. This is PET CT. So again you have scintillation detectors like you had in gamma camera, you have detectors in uh, PET-CT. The most commonly used detectors are VGO and uh, LYS. Uh, for it to qualify or quantify as a good uh, detector, uh, it should have a high photo fraction, the light output should be good, the DP constant should be uh, less. VGO is mainly used in studies where oncology, based on oncology where FAT and FTG is used as the tracer. LYSO is preferred for uh, short-lived high isotopes where there is, um, uh, you know, uh, high count rate study and uh, you want to image quickly and at the same time not lose the uh, image quality. Next slide. This is uh, actually a cross-section of how a uh, PET system looks like. All the purple uh, things are all the detectors with the PMP book attached. Next slide. Next, um, This is the detector with the associated electronics. So what do we image in PET? We, you, we are first look at the types of coincidence. True coincidence is the simultaneous detection of two emissions resulting from a single decay. This is what is called as a true event. Scatter coincidence is when one, when one or both photons from a single event are scattered and both are detected. This is the origin where the uh, annihilation has taken place. This photon from here directly goes and hits the detector. But this has, the path is deviated and it is hits the detector later. It is also taken up as an event. Uh, but this will actually not contribute to the image quality, contrast and resolution. It will actually contribute to the degradation of the image. And random coincidence is the simultaneous detection of emission from one from more than one decay. So you have two events here, one is detected here and one is detected here. These are completely unrelated events. So random and scatter add to the noise and uh, degradation of image contrast and resolution. So what we do is that we use reconstructive techniques, image reconstructive techniques to, uh, to minimize the damage caused by scatter and random. Next slide, please. So you have a Typical configuration of a PET CT is whole body PET which has got a 70 cm core and axial field of view of 70.5 cm. The scintillated uh, crystals coupled to the PNPOs 
is called a cylindrical geometry, almost 32 rings of crystal. And, uh, and you know, there are about 10,000 crystals in a pet capital. And it's got, and what happens is when there are so many events, this is the patient lying here, and at the same time you have the events occurring. So there are, so each event when it occurs and it is measured, it is called as a line of response. This is typically the number of lines of response that happen in a, in a pet detector. Next slide, please. So this is a true event. The true event is detected and then it is processed and you get the The other configurations that are available are mainly for brain imaging, animal pet and mammogram. Next slide. So how do you organize this data? It's a lot of data that is coming out of a pet CT, pet machine. So you have so many lines of response. You have to find out for, you have to know which are your true counts, which is actually going to give you the right picture and you don't want the random and the scatter to degrade your uh, image quality. So true counts in an LOR are accumulated. In some cases, groups of nearby LORs are grouped into one average line of response and the LORs are reorganized into projections. So, you have these projections like this. From all angles, they are picked up and then uh, an image is formed. Next slide, slide please. Uh, in the earlier systems, you, we had a 2D and a 3D.